My name is Carolyn Doherty, and I work here at Seattle University. I work in admissions and student services, assisting students in their discernment process. And I'm here sitting today with the Reverend Dr. Edward Donaldson, who's the interim director of the Doctor of Ministry program here at Seattle University. How are you today? I am wonderful, Carolyn, and I'm so happy to be sitting here with you this afternoon, and particularly happy um, to say thank you, first and foremost, for your wonderful work with our students, mm. um, supporting them, encouraging them, and helping them discern their what's now and what's next. Thank you for that work. You know, as an alumni of Seattle University, I bring not only my experience and life-changing experience of coming here, but my hope is that any student that I serve leaves here with the feeling that this was one of the better decisions they ever made. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I think our faculty and the, the entire university has that hope as well. I concur. And it's, this can be a very life-changing experience and a huge decision yeah. to kind of uh, take this step into uh, a graduate program or a doctoral, doctoral program particularly. Um, and the way the doctoral program is set up, I think is, is a, a, a very um, flexible in its nature in many ways so that people can step into it without totally disconnecting from uh, their, their family and work responsibilities. Would you say that accurate? Oh, absolutely. Um, a part of the um, theory behind the doctoral program here is that we are working alongside of folks who are practitioners. Um, and in order to do that, people have to continue to practice. And so our job is to partner with practitioners of the sacred, technicians of the sacred, um, of, of religion, of spirituality, of theology, as they do good work in the world. You know, here at Seattle University, our goal is to educate the entire person mm -hmm. toward a more just and humane world. And so mm -hmm. most of our doctoral students um, bring themselves, not just as student, but as spouse and partner, as parent, as theologian, as a practitioner, as all of the things that make up their whole humanity. Mm. Yeah. That's so beautiful. You know, and I think one of the things that makes our program distinctive is that we are very interested in, in diversity of spiritual beliefs, mm. of orientations, mm. uh, which makes for a very rich environment mm. to grow in. Yeah. You know, I think looking at some of the other programs and in my role in talking to students who are comparing, let's say, Seattle U to another seminary, let's say, mm -hmm. um, they are impressed by our commitment to bringing people together who may not normally come together. Mm -hmm. And through that experience, I think the hope is, is that one's own faith is deepened mm. while we also get to know each other. Because as, as, as we've seen a lot in the world today, so much of the conflict and negativity is arising from the us versus them mm. polarity. mindset yeah. and that polarity is mm -hmm. I pray differently than you or I love differently than you I'm good you're bad you know that kind of that kind of thinking mm -hmm. is is what is the antithesis of creating more just and humane world as we think about the history of, of religion and the history of theology no religion, no theological school of thought, no theologic um, is monolithic. Mm -hmm. Even in its homogeneity, mm -hmm. there's no monolithic religious expression or experience. And what happens as we become more and more siloed in our faith traditions mm -hmm. and our religious experiences, mm -hmm. we begin to think monolithically. When mm. the reality is there's always plurality um, even in our own faith traditions and in our backgrounds as um, as a bishop in the Lord's Church um, in the Christian tradition what I understand is that there's never been one Christianity right. 
there's always been multiple Christianities going back as far as Christianity itself goes into the first century and the original biblical text. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see multiple ways of being a follower of the teachings of Jesus, a follower of the way. There are multiple ways to be Buddhist. There are multiple ways to be um, Zoroastrian, right? It, it really doesn't matter what your faith um, tradition is in its um, particular way of being, there are multiple ways of being that particular thing. Mm -hmm. So um, what we do here at Seattle University is we bring people from across the spectrum of mm -hmm. faith traditions together to add value to one another, to learn from one another, and as you've already said, to deepen your own sense of understanding of both the self and the world around you. Mm, I love that, I love that. You know, one of the, the themes that I have seen flow through your classes and your program is the living of gospel values. And I, I am so fascinated by how you, how that is presented in, in the classroom and in the program. There is um, what appears to be really Christian or Christocentric language there and engaging society in gospel values. But the truth of the matter is every faith tradition has its gospel. Mm -hmm. If we look at that word as good news, right? What is your faith tradition? What is the message of that tradition to the world? What is that good news? Mm -hmm. And then how do you engage the society as a whole around those core tenets of good news that are particular to your religious tradition. And we're really asking the question, um, again, I'll, I'll use the Christian context, what does following Jesus have to say to uh, immigration? Mm. What does following Jesus have to say to laissez-faire capitalism? What does um, following Jesus have to say to healthcare? and who should have health care and how health care should be provided mm -hmm. and um, what is the responsibility of the collective mm -hmm. for the least of these, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's engaging society in gospel values. And you can come at that from a following of Jesus and you can come at that from what does Zen Buddhism have to say mm -hmm. about who should receive health care and how health care should be executed mm -hmm. within a society or what does it have to say about immigration and what does it have to say about borders and what does it have to say and ultimately what we end up finding out in these communities created by um, individuals from their particulars is that there are some universal things mm. that our religious traditions have to say about the core goodness of humanity um, about the ethic of neighbor love about how we show up for one another, about how we treat the poor and the marginalized, uh, or those experiencing poverty, mm -hmm. the marginalized, those who are unsheltered and unhoused, mm -hmm. right? That these faith traditions um, tend to have a lot more agreement. That's right. About mm -hmm. what is good news to those that are disinherited, disenfranchised, marginalized, um, not in the center of power and privilege. And those multiple faith traditions have a lot of similarities about what they have to say to those who are in the center of power and about how to handle privilege mm. and how to handle abundance and how to handle wealth and how to handle power. Um, those, those connections are much closer than, than we really oftentimes think that they are. Yeah, which is which is a, a very hopeful message mm. and it is incumbent upon all of us who share a deep belief in the as you said the the true goodness of humans the the true desire that deeply held desire f to be compassionate you know we are wired for compassion mm. as mm -hmm. a species mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are wired to support and to love and to care yes and when we bring people who may express that differently together in a place like a university, you know, where we get to support each other in our unique expressions of that, mm -hmm. you know, that builds our own sense of hopefulness yes. and resiliency. Yes. That no matter what's going on in the in the realm of politics and that that there are people on the ground doing good in this world. Yeah. 
you know, as you talk about um, where we are kind of on the tra trajectory of history in the United States, I, I really believe that that is a microcosm of where we are in the evolution of human society. Um, because if you look at um, our global situation, the same polarities that we're experiencing in North America mm -hmm. are happening in the global village. Mm -hmm. um, that, that Europe is having its own issues um, with polarity, that Africa is having its own issues, Asia is having its own issues, like the globe is having issues with polarity. I, I think one thing that we are unpacking in the program is this next move in the evolution of society it has something to do with decentering our ideas of normativity and how we've made uh, norm the standard because uh, disappointment is a function of expectation mm -hmm. and when when our expectation is that normal is me and you are other, mm -hmm. these polarities erupt and emerge and they show up. But when I take off this lens and this layer that normativity is the standard, that you must be normal and I am the standard of norm, and I can actually embrace you for the fundamental goodness and truth of who you are, rather than holding you to a manufactured standard of normativity. Ah, yes, ah, yes. The polarities <laughs> begin to dissipate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's not over and against. Yeah. You're not a juxtaposition to my humanity, yeah. right? Um, one famous quote is that nothing that is human is uncommon to me, mm -hmm. for I am human. I am human. Yeah. Well, it, you know, as plebeian as, as this saying is, <laughs> that normal is a setting on a washing machine. <laughs> and to apply it to humans yes. means I am bringing my biases, yes. my values, yes. my preferences, yes. and my opinions and laying them on you. Yes. And I can hold those. I can hold biases and preferences and opinions and hold them and they be sacred for me and value systems for me that I don't have to charge you with. That's right. And that's a learned, that, that mm -hmm. way of being in the world is a learned orientation. Well, and I think it's a, it requires a, a, an immense amount of internal looking and discernment of who am I? Yeah, yes. Who am I? Yeah, which is why our, I think our program yeah. is rooted kind of in, in two core um, courses of thought. Mm -hmm. One, I call it practitioner as purpose, as mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. rather, mm -hmm. which is leading from spiritual depth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That I as a leader show up fully aware of my own spirituality, my own social location, all of my stuff, my backpack, my invisible backpack mm -hmm. that comes with me, that shows up. But if I don't know what's in it, yeah. and I don't know how to, how to relate to what's in it, and how what's in my backpack shows up for you, mm -hmm. then I'm not the leader that I can be for a changing global community. Mm -hmm. And then the other course, of course, we talked about is engaging society in gospel values. Mm -hmm. This is me as practitioner, as person, and this is what my faith tradition brings mm -hmm. to the larger conversation. Hmm. Right? And that those two conversations, at least in the first year <clears throat> of the program, anchor the program so that as students begin to investigate their particular questions toward their doctor of ministry, they do so with a full awareness or a broader awareness of themselves as investigator mm -hmm. and their faith tradition and how that faith tradition impacts the question and the praxis of their work. Mm. Um, so that's, that's the heart. That's kind of the, the thought process, how we're thinking through the trajectory of what it means to earn a doctorate of ministry. Yeah. It's really interesting, you know, I, I, that, that term of the, you know, the backpack and unpacking the backpack. And of course, I don't know what yours looks like, but mm. as I have gotten more mileage on my own personal odometer, <laughs> I have found that my backpack has all kinds of nooks and crannies oh, yes. and secret compartments yes. that I didn't know were there. Yes. And part of, I think, the, the process and the hope, 
and then that Seattle University being based in a in a Jesuit framework. Yes. That is, you know, has the 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 Jesuit pedagogic process. Yes. Of self examination. Yes. Action, re examination. Yes. More action. Um, you know that that this doctorate program is within this larger context of a Jesuit university. Yes. You know, as another dimension that is of, I, I would, I would hope, of w would make it very attractive. Yes. Because in the the larger structure of the university is very much in support of this constant discernment, interior looking process that the program itself demands. It's interesting, it, you talk about that odometer and, and how things change as we rack up miles on our personal <laughs> odometers. I'm gonna <laughs> remember that. <laughs> For personal odometer and it's racking up miles. And I think if you roll back that odometer 20 years ago, I don't know mm -hmm. how many miles that is, but 20 <laughs> years ago, um, I would not have the language to say to you that I am a cisgendered male. And because I didn't have the language, it's not that it wasn't true. Right. It's that I didn't have the language by which to talk about how that truth impacts both my understanding of the world mm -hmm. and the way I am understood in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what this program seeks to do is mm. to help folks discover language yeah. wow. that, that wow. moves them further on the journey so that the miles and the ticks on the odometer have a different value. It's not that it changes the miles or the ticks. It's, it's my ability to relate to the ticks and the miles in a different way because I have new language for that. Mm -hmm. And as I show up, then um, I show up with a different set of tools in that same backpack mm -hmm. um, than I would have had you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, all, of, all of the things that I would say now were true. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have a way to talk about mm -hmm. that truth. Well, and it was not part of the conversation. And that's as well. what this work does. It changes the conversation mm -hmm. and it helps you engage the conversation in the now. Mm -hmm. It also helps you um, unpack the questions that are emerging in the conversation, right? Um, I think where you enter the conversation matters. But where you leave from this place in the conversation is surely much different than where you were when you came in. That, yeah, is like, you know, come as you are, uh, leave differently. Yes. With, hopefully, through the experience of, the, of being here with your classmates, your faculty in this university, in this place, that, that it's almost like, you know, going to the gym and developing a muscle. Yes. You know, that is gonna, the hope would be, I can imagine, that the skills, the knowledge, the discoveries made while you're part of the program become a working part of your the next step. Mm. I think about my, myself as a, as a Pentecostal um, bishop uh, at one point in my life, I would say Pentecostal, now moving more toward a Metacostal framework. But when I think about the gift of Seattle University, mm -hmm. I think about um, conversations around the examine, the Jesuit practice, spiritual mm -hmm. practice of mm -hmm. the examine, which I wouldn't be in dialogue with you about mm -hmm. if I was not um, Pentecostal embedded in a Jesuit university. Mm. And I think um, we are now able to talk about the examine, you being from a Catholic background, but not a Catholic, um, we're able to use that as a touchstone yeah. to communicate about spirituality mm -hmm. uh, in a way that makes sense for both of us. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense because we have been in this place That's and right. in this space together. Mm -hmm. The gift of, the gift of uh, proximity, mm -hmm. I think is, is, is a wonderful jewel that surfaces up in working on your doctorate in this context, mm -hmm. is that you are proximate. And when you are proximate, what troubles you becomes troubling to me. Mm. What is of value to you becomes of value to me. The whole conversation shifts now because I am seeing the world 
through the eyes of another mm -hmm. that I have not made a radical other. Right. Another it, who yeah. is not the other. And when we come together in a place like this that embraces differences, mm -hmm. that that creates a space for to, to express who we each are. Yes. I personally, as a as a student here, walked in here with all kinds of ideas mm. about those people. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, fill in the blank. Mm. And then when I sat with them in classrooms and did classes and did projects with them and heard them talk about their lives, they became flesh and blood. Mm. And I saw our similarities. And we do that all the time. We're constantly out there in the outside world, outside of the luxury of being in a place like this. Mm -hmm. It's a very luxurious experience yes. being here. Yeah, I love that word, luxurious. It is. It's yeah. the only way I can describe it. Yeah. Just to be pe to be with people who are drawn because they 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 are deeply connected with their own spiritual dimension. What else makes it luxurious for me is that you are a public theologian, right? Um, and, and maybe you wouldn't name yourself that way, and so I don't want to put words in your mouth. But as I see it, you have taken your theologic mm -hmm. and used it to formulate your way of being in student services. Mm -hmm. Th this is what this program is really designed for. This is what the work of Seattle University's higher education religious initiatives mm -hmm. are designed for is, mm -hmm. is that people like yourself who have a certain theologic, a certain theological lens, a certain way of understanding the divine, take that way of understanding the divine and of understanding themselves and turn it into something of service mm -hmm. and something that is useful in the world so that you are not doing pastoring in a parish context. Mm -hmm. But there is something of pastoral care yeah. in the way you hold students, in the way you walk with students, even in the way you talk about discernment of whether or not this is the right place. And is this a part of your next? That's all based on a theologic, an understanding mm -hmm. of the divine, mm -hmm. an understanding of the sacred, an understanding of human worth and value, and, and that's what makes this a luxurious place. You know, that was my experience here as a student. Mm. And I would hope that all of our students feel that deep respect for their process, their journey, as, as obscured as it may be, especially many of the students I work with that are not, haven't determined that this is the right place, the path can feel very obscured. Yeah. There can be the pull. And I remember for me too, it was a pull that then became a push. Mm. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I was here. And, um, you know, so to assist students is a, 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 a incredible honor to have conversations with students in a in, in a very safe I hope always a very safe container for them to talk about their fears their misgivings their confusion um, and uh, and just assist with you know what is my next indicated step here yeah you know talking to a lot of students who are interested in all of our different programs here mm -hmm. at Seattle University one of the major concerns is financing their program yeah what what words of wisdom do you have you know it, it, it's interesting one doesn't go into people helping um, life um, because of money but money sure does help helping people doesn't it um, you know Seattle you is a wonderful place um, in helping students yeah. find ways to be creative around finances yeah whether that's scholarships, whether that's grants, whether that's, this is a place that is resourced to help people help themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that we have so many partners mm -hmm. that work with us in helping to prepare students um, 
toward a more just and humane world mm -hmm. and helping students craft narratives that help other people buy into and sow into and support that work and, and that initiative. I would never let money be the hindrance to pursuing mm -hmm. um, what you feel is your your call, your invitation of the spirit, however you talk about it in your own spiritual tradition and journey. Um, I believe that there's always provision for vision. You know, one of the things that I like to also add in the conversation is when you think about financing your education to do what you feel like is your heart's work, that your purpose in this life, I was, I, I was, I'm, I'm aligning myself with m the vision for my life. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's, it's like putting a, building a house that you're gonna live in for a long time. That's so true, that's so true. And if anybody out there that has owned a house <laughs> and gone to try to remodel a house, an that's old right. house, uh, it can be very expensive. So why not build a, a place that you're gonna live in that is absolutely in alignment with your deepest dreams of your own life? Now that's luxurious. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's possible. It is possible. It is possible. I, I'm so excited about the program. I'm so excited about the opportunity to work with students who are so passionate mm. about engaging the world yeah. in justice, in humaneness, in making whole what is fractured and broken. Mm. I'm excited about the brilliant scholars that I get to work with on a daily basis, but I'm most excited about this place where you bring your whole self mm -hmm. and discover more. Mm. So I invite students to bring their whole selves and discover more. Right Thanks, on. Carolyn. Thank you, Dr. Donaldson. <laughs>